look on the back and see. They're right when we get. The uh, Dayton City Commission meeting will now come to order. Uh, please rise for the invocation. Uh, this uh, evening, given by Commissioner Shaw, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear God, we pray for your blessings upon this city. We ask that you touch our hearts, individually and collectively, that we may come together in unity. We pray for those who are less fortunate and ask that you touch them and keep them safe. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Ms. Blackshear, may I have the roll call, please? Mayor Mims. Aye. Commissioner Joseph. Aye. Shaw. Aye. Bear Chow. Aye. Turner Sloss. Aye. Okay, may I have a motion then to approve the minutes from the um, February 22nd meeting? So uh, moved, Your Honor. Second the motion, Your Honor. Okay, it's been probably moved and seconded to approve the minutes from the February 22nd meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Yeah. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, we've done that. Got that. Got that. Got that. Okay. Good. So, Ms. Blackshear, do we have any communications or petitions? All have been distributed, Your Honor. Okay. So we have a presentation uh, this evening. So I think uh, presentation will be given to us by your county com uh, auditor. Recorder. Recorder. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm changing, I'm changing your title. You know, I, got, I got the your right. And county. County is right. Okay, got the your right. And the purpose of your being here is to talk about the veterans ID cards. So I got that right as well. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Commissioners, uh, my purpose of being here today, uh, I just wanted to share just a little bit of information, of course, about the veteran identification card, and I have some other comments I would just like to make uh, to the respective body and the members of the community who are here today. Um, 2018, uh, I uh, took the initiative and I introduced a program called the Veterans Identification Card Program. Uh, I'm a veteran. I know you are a veteran, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I know many of the uh, participants here uh, and members of the community here today are veterans. Veteran community service is something that ties us all together. It is something that if you are not a veteran, you know someone who is. It is something that's near and dear to my heart, and I know everyone's heart in here because in large part our close proximity to Wright Pat and the fact that we have seen military service be a foundation for community time and time again here. This program has been offered to the nearly 60,000 veterans that we have throughout the Miami Valley. To date, we've issued several thousand identification cards. Currently, this identification card can be used as a form of state-issued ID. It can be used to assist with the earning of service credit hours. It can be used to obtain a benefit, a, uh, any type of positivity, uh, just as a token of your honorable service to this nation. And so I unfortunately have to report that uh, in about a month and a half, the veteran identification card will no longer be able to be used as a form of state issued ID for the form of voting purposes. You know, it's been said that democracy is not the law of the majority, but rather the protection of our communities most vulnerable. You see, their opinions, all of us, the opinions on all issues of public concern, even if they represent but a silent whisper, are just as important as the loudest voice. Any actions taken by the government which seek to silence or disenfranchise one amongst us ultimately threaten us all. You see, democracy belongs to each and every one of us, and we must preserve it, we must protect it, so that way we have something to pass on. House Bill 458 clearly does not promote democracy or protect those who seek it. Rather, this, this bill, which will go into effect in April, undermines those who are already struggling due to limited meager resources, while also eliminating the ability to exercise one of our most cherished constitutional rights, a right that I was prepared to lay my life down for, and I know you as well, Mr. Mayor, that being the right to vote. If one voter is left behind, 
That's one voter too many. The right to vote should be enjoyed equally by all of us, regardless of political affiliation and regardless of economic status or resource. You see, there's no such thing as democracy without accountability from voters. All voters. Voter disenfranchisement robs the voices from the vulnerable and turns the hopeful into the hopeless. Only together for our community will we prevail. I would like to invite you all and to thank you in advance for um, standing with me as we stand with our community's most vulnerable. I've talked to most of you and I know that I've received different comments about the effect that this could potentially have on at least one person that we all know. It is imperative that we take a stand for democracy and against anything that threatens it, otherwise it will no longer remain. So with that, I want to open the floor to the respective body for any comments or questions. I will implore you if I have the answer, then you have it. And if not, as you know, I'm not a man who's short on words. We'll find it together. Okay. And, uh, and you sound great with, uh, when you're sharing the information as well. So appreciate that. Uh, Commissioners, Commissioner Turner Schloss, any uh, comments or questions? Thank you, Your Honor. No, I believe he said it well. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here, uh, Recorder, and thank you very much for your uh, your service, your commitment. And I, again, I want to thank you as well as Commissioner Joseph for introducing this legislation. So you didn't call me, but nonetheless, you know you have my support. So thank you. Commissioner thank Fairchild. <coughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for coming and speaking in support of this, uh, the informal resolution that we have and against the uh, bill that disenfranchises people. I think we all, um, uh, in this body, um, stand with you and the, recognize the importance of not putting additional barriers in the way of people to vote. Um, I've spent many years working to get people out to vote and know how uh, difficult it can be for some people. I think particularly uh, people who have disabilities and uh, some of your veterans, I imagine, would be in those uh, in those categories as well. And so it's um, disheartening that uh, that card won't be able to be used and uh, other forms of ID won't be as well. And so uh, we're going to continue this work and uh, it may last for a moment, but in the long run, we will get there to enfranchise everyone. Yeah. I too want to thank you. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> thank you for your service, um, Mr. Recorder, and uh, and thank you for the work that you've been doing and continue to do to support our veterans, to make life just a little bit easier for them. And that's what we should be doing. And uh, this uh, law is not gonna gonna do that. So I appreciate you <coughs> standing up for our veterans and uh, continuing to push. And we we're there with you. Thank you, hey, Mr. Joseph. Uh, you know, over my career, I found that if I'm on the side of the folks who are trying to get more people out to vote, I'm usually on the right side, right? Mm -hmm. And here you are, you've done great work uh, making sure not only the work with veterans to make sure that they have ID, but also effectively enabling more people to vote and take part in our democracy. So thank you for those efforts. Thank you for uh, working to get this done. It's an uphill battle, as we know, uh, which only increases my respect for you for taking it mm -hmm. on. So thank you for being here. Thanks for your work. Uh, we are solidly behind you. Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, we, we've talked a lot about this issue. And uh, again, um, you're aware of the fact that uh, when I said that I volunteered to go to Vietnam as a 19-year-old um, uh, serviceman for the um, responsibility that I felt I had to protect the Constitution. And, and looking at the rights and privileges of the Constitution, uh, going to the military uh, back in 1965 and, and then going to Vietnam again in 1967, the aspect of, of laying my life on the line to prove to this country that I cared enough for the country to do that. Uh, and thinking that when I got back, I would have all the rights and privileges that the Constitution said we're supposed to have. Now, of course, we're still fighting for those. And uh, this fight is another one of those indicators that the battle was not won yet. Yeah. Um, the aspect of trying to get more and more people to understand and realize that those communities that vote the most get the most. And uh, as we are talking to young people, as you know, you participated in our teen voting project uh, for the last 10 years as we get 18-year-olds, we take them to vote for the first time, and we tell them clearly 
to read up on the issues, talk to the parents, talk to the teachers, and many of them bring the parents with them when they come to vote. And they're voting for four things. Issues and candidates that benefit them, issues and candidates that benefit their livelihood, uh, issues and candidates that benefit their community, and, issue, uh, and, and their family. So those four reasons, those four reasons only, not because someone is Republican, Democrat, tall, short, white, black, male, female, it's just those four reasons in terms of why they should vote. Uh, so I thank you for your continued effort. I know I've used my veteran's card, my veteran's ID card, that sometimes to, to get on a plane. I've used it sometimes to get discounts. I've used it sometimes, you know, when I'm just showing off the fact that I'm a veteran because I'm proud of that. Okay? So, um, so good. Thank you so, again so much for your work, and we'll do everything we can to help. And uh, maybe there will be another bill that we can get in place to try to move people back in the right direction to uh, protect those who are most vulnerable, those who, again, laid their lives on the line, and some of them did not pick them up, did not pick them up. So thank you again for your, your time, your efforts. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you yeah. to the respective commission. Have a great night. Thanks, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Blackshear, do we have any additions or additional comments, deletions to the calendar? I have none, Your Honor. None? Okay. Ms. Dixon, any uh, additions, deletions, or comments to the calendar? I have no additions or deletions to this evening's calendar, Your Honor. I do have a few items I'd like to highlight. Um, item number two is a service agreement with LJB Inc. It is consulting services for the U.S. Route 35 pedestrian bridge design work. You know, we've talked with you a couple of times about efforts to find funding to date. We have not secured funding for its construction, but we wanted to move ahead and get the design done so when we did secure funding, we'd be able to move quickly. There is a very um, attractive notice of funding opportunity that we think um, fits our situation best because it's about bringing divided communities back together from you know governmental intervention in the 60s and et cetera. So we think we have a really good chance there. So I'm excited about that. Um, wanted to just um, call out that there, um, you will note on the agenda that there were no uh, minority participation goals achieved. That is because this requires um, pre-qualified vendors from ODOT because it is crossing their infrastructure and there was not a um, PEP certified company pre-qualified as per the RFP requirements. Um, item number five is an award of contract with Plague Care LLC. This is another great investment brought to the neighborhoods by the Dayton Recovery Plan. This is a upgrade to the Bomberger Park playground equipment. Uh, you will note that there um, are two funding sources. One is a donation from St. Anne's Hill of 33500 um, which is... Um, uh, greatly appreciated and is going towards some of the younger children's um, equipment that we we typically look at 5 to 12 when we're putting our playground equipment together and St. Anne's raised money to be able to address some of the younger toddlers um, play play areas and we had four bids received the lower bid was unable to meet our MBE participation goal so we picked the next lowest bidder uh, for this project so excited about that investment coming to Bomberger Park and then finally items uh, ordinances uh, items number 11, 12, and 13 are three ordinances that are supporting PACE funding for the North Arcade project. This is a, a $40 million total project um, cost project that uh, supports PACE, finan uh, PACE funding. There is a, a maximum of $11.7 million. Um, they anticipate that this um, will, cr they will need about $4.5 million. This is again an assessment tool where they assess themselves to create revenues to support um, in this case, sustainability improvements such as um, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and um, excited about, about this project. This is the first component rolling through 
There will be before you um, by the end of March a development agreement that will have in it community benefits agreements. There will be a presentation um, for that when that comes forward to you so you'll get more of the detailed presentation, a little bit more elaborate to what we talked about in the briefings regarding this project earlier. Uh, so just wanted to let you know that's coming towards the end of March to be able to support um, and there's also a, a CRA agreement that's going to be coming. So there's a development agreement and a CRA agreement, um, and that comes through at the end of March, early April, because of the April 16th closing that they're working towards. So excited about that investment coming. And that is all I have for you this evening. Okay. Ms. Blackshear, do we have any citizens who are registered to speak on calendar items? Yes, Your Honor. There are 18 citizens who have registered to speak. I would like to state that there is a three minute time limit. As you address the commission, we ask that you state your name and address for the record. At that time, I will turn on the green light. When the green light comes on, you will have three minutes to speak. After you have spoken two and a half minutes, a yellow light will come on. You will have 30 seconds remaining to speak. When the red light comes on, you will be asked to cease your comments and to take your seat. To the audience and attendance, I ask everyone to be respectful by refraining from any utterance, gesture, or conversation that will prevent the City Commission from hearing the speaker's comments. I call to the podium Sham Reedy. Name and address for the record, please. Sham. R-E-D-D-Y, ready, uh, 513 Windsor Park, Dayton, Ohio, 45459. You may begin. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for allowing us to speak on this issue. I uh, just want to, I was here last week, I spoke about some issues, but I got some, a few other things I want to bring, bring up to you. It's not about being for or against. It's about the opportunity to sit down and discuss and find a common solution. And that's the bottom line. Uh, let me begin with uh, only housing issue, uh, the voucher providers that have an issue with our members is GDPM. Unfortunately, they are the largest issuer of the vouchers in the Montgomery County. And I talked to other members of our organization about the voucher programs in other counties, like Green County, other county, they don't have near as many issues as, as they do here. Okay, uh, all right, uh, the, the problem stems from uh, excessive delays in processing the applications and inconsistencies consistencies in inspections or reinspections. Housing provider who are members should have a choice whether or not to deal with the G G G GDPM. It's not the tenants. We have no issue with the tenants at all. Of course, they got common issues that are normal. Uh, I know a couple of city commissioners have meetings with GDPM CEO, and they admitted to having uh, issues, and they promised to fix them. Here's my point. You, we cannot pass a resolution based on promises. We have to base upon performance, right? Uh, city council wants to see if they we, we want the city council to see if they would actually perform uh, before passing this legislation. All right? If they can perform, then we have an opportunity for our members, the housing providers, can rethink their situation whether or not to deal with GDPM. It's not the voucher issue at all. Okay. My request is to delay passing this ordinance until we see some performance from GDPM. Housing providers are not against the vouchers. It's what comes with it. It's kind of bothersome, right? Uh, inconsistencies. Let me give a small example of inconsistencies. Once they come in and inspect the unit, they give you 30 days to finish the repairs. When they come back, they should stick to that list. They always find a new item. It goes back another 30 days again, another 30 days again. So that's the problem. All right, even if the bill passes, uh, resolution passes, we should have some kind of oversight and uh, see if they are really performing because that really affects how the views of our housing providers will change. So that's my uh, request to the commissioners. Thank you so much for, for allowing us to speak. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Right. Have a good day. Marty Garris. Name and address for the record, please. Hello, I'm Marty Garris. I'm the clerk of Dayton Municipal Court. My address is 208 Rowe Avenue, W-R-O-E Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, 45406. You may begin. Thank you. you. Commissioners, Mayor Mims, thank you for having me once again. Thanks for considering this legislation for source of income. Uh, this legislation is an important first step in ensuring everyone in our community has equal opportunity to quality housing. You all will hear from a variety of different voices today. Those supporting it, those opposing it, uh, all of that is gonna be here. I think there are 18 people who are scheduled to speak on this legislation today. Uh, all the, most of these concerns are not new. They have been addressed. We have had conversations with them. Uh, in fact, most of these concerns were raised during the drafting of this legislation. Uh, the Realtors, the Greater Dayton Apartment Association, were at the table during the creation of these and expressed these concerns personally to me. I brought a lot of these concerns personally to you guys as well. Uh, I do not believe that this legislation will require landlords to accept housing choice vouchers. They disagree. This legislation prohibits discrimination, which means that a landlord can no longer use solely a tenant source of income to determine whether or not they qualify for their units. That is what this legislation does. Further, it ensures that tenants that receive disability, veterans benefits, social security, alimony, child support, and other non-wage sources of income can secure housing without being discriminated against based solely off those forms of income. None of those sources were previously protected under state law or federal law. These are important steps that we are taking. These are valuable protections that our residents deserve to have, and they will have a lasting impact on our community. So I take this opportunity to once again thank you for considering this legislation. If you have any questions for me, you all have my cell phone number. You ought to get a hold of me. And thank you again for uh, considering this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again. <clears throat> Deborah Levy. Your name and address for the record, please. Deborah Levy, I work at Advocates for Basic Legal Equality. The address is 130 West 2nd Street, Suite 700, Dayton, Ohio, 45402. You may begin. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Hey. Matthew Desmond, in his 2016 Pulitzer Prize winning book, Evicted, defined home this way. The home is the center of life. It is a refuge from the grind of work, the pressure of school, and the menace of the streets. The home is the wellspring of personhood. It is where our identity takes root and blossoms, where as children we imagine, play, and question, and as adolescents where we retreat and try. As we grow older, we hope to settle into a place to raise a family or pursue work. When we try to understand ourselves, we often begin by considering the kind of home in which we were raised. For many tenants, finding a home is elusive due to their source of income. Segregation along race and wealth lines has a long history in the United States, and the stain of policies from decades ago, such as the Federal Housing Administration lending policies, continues to amar American cities. Institutional and governmental rules promoted investment in communities only available to whites while divesting from low-income and minority neighborhoods. Today's residential segregation in the North, South, Midwest, and West is not the unintended consequences of individual choices and of otherwise well-meaning law regulation, but of unhidden public policy that explicitly segregated every metropolitan area in the United States, Richard Rothstein in his book, Color of Law. On behalf of advocates for basic legal equality, nonprofit law firm that represents low-income individuals and groups in civil matters, we urge you to pass source of income protection. All people have the right to a safe and stable home, which provides a foundation to build better future for themselves and their families. Indeed, stable housing helps ensure that people live healthy lives, that children thrive in school, and that families have access to economic opportunity. Yet many families have difficulty obtaining housing simply because of their source of income. State and local laws prohibiting SOI discrimination began to emerge in the 70s, steady, steadily spreading across the country and increasing exponentially in the 
2000s. According to the Poverty and Race Research Action Council, as of January of this year, 21 states and 125 cities across the United States have adopted SOI protection. 18 municipalities in Ohio have adopted it as well. Dayton should adopt SOI protection for the following three reasons. First, SOI protections increase the use of Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers. A study by HUD in 2018 found that Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher denial rates in cities without SOI protection top 78%. But once SOI protections were enacted, the denial rates reached as low as 15%. Second, Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher participants are long-term tenants who stay on the program for an average of six and a half years, according to a 2017 HUD study. Before obtaining a voucher, families can often sit on wait lists for years. Once they receive a voucher, they have a short time to use it or lose it. One uh, mother shared the story of her adult son. He tried to use his voucher 12 different places, but landlords <coughs> repeatedly told him that they do not accept the voucher. Okay. Thank you for me. your comments. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Levy. Thank you. Can you leave that information for us? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Jill Bucario. Your name and address for the record, please. Yep, my name is Jill Bucaro. Address is 1015 Carlisle Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, 45420. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Mims and City of Dayton Commissioners for giving me the opportunity to share with you why I support passing the source of income legislation today. I'm a social worker by trade, and I'm currently the manager of Holistic Defense Services at the Montgomery County Public Defender's Office. We provide advocacy and case management services to clients of our office, so individuals in Montgomery County who are facing criminal charges. Prior to working at the Public Defender's Office, I worked at Daybreak, a youth homeless shelter, where I provided case management and clinical services to young adults experiencing homelessness for over eight years. In my decades of working with individuals experiencing homelessness and individuals facing criminal charges, I have seen firsthand how difficult it is for poor and marginalized individuals to access safe and secure housing. But since the tornadoes in 2019 and the eviction moratorium, which I do know was necessary during COVID, I have watched the quantity of affordable housing stock dwindle to alarmingly low numbers. Creating an even larger issue, many of the property managers and landlords of the few affordable units that there are are unwilling to work with clients who have vouchers. Vouchers that are provided to individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, vouchers um, that are for permanent supportive housing for individuals experiencing homelessness, and Section 8 vouchers. In the past two years, me and my team have watched dozens of people lose their vouchers and their chance at stability because they could not find a unit that took their subsidy. As I said, I have spent more than a decade providing direct service to individuals with acute housing needs, and I currently sit on many coalitions to address a myriad of issues plaguing our city. Issues like infant mortality, mass incarceration, gun violence, accidental overdose deaths, and barriers facing individuals in reentry from our prison systems, and it barriers facing individuals with severe and persistent mental illness. And the solution always boils down to one thing, safe housing. Until we wrap our arms around the housing crisis in this city, we will never make real headway on these other various initiatives and issues. Passing this source of income legislation will certainly not solve the problem in its entirety, but I believe that it is a crucial step in reducing barriers for some of our most marginalized community members. I understand why landlords and property managers must take into consideration things like eviction histories and past and current criminal charges, but simply being poor shouldn't be exclusionary criteria for a safe place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bacaro. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Jeff Bowling. Name and address for the record. Jeff Bowling, 1822 Wileen Drive. Beaver Creek, Ohio, 45432. You may begin. Thank you. Well, thank you for the, for the time this evening. Uh, the, um, in, the, in the words of Mark Twain, I guess I want to share a, 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 few, a few thoughts. Uh, he, he had commented, uh, there's lies, darn lies, and statistics. so I have a few statistics to share. Uh, the, one of the real questions that would come to mind is, does the city know who your customer is, who you're wanting? And that is housing providers. Those housing providers are a lot of individual owners, basically small businesses. From the Montgomery County 
uh, property records. Um, there's a quarter of a million property records out there, and it breaks down to the majority of the people who are in there are small property owners. Of the, uh, there are over 13,000 names listed in the Montgomery County tax records that only own two properties. So the people who own many of these properties are small businesses. And one of the things that small businesses have, they have been severely affected by all the supply chain issues. We've seen so much of that. And there's some statistics out there from some major companies that help to streamline supply issues for major corporations. And those supply issues can cause a reduction of anywhere from six to 10% in revenues. That's revenues, not just profit. So in just going through some of the things that a small property owner might be dealing with, if you're looking at, say, $850 a month in rent, $280 in mortgage, $195 in taxes and insurance, management fee, $68, that leaves about $305 to pay for turnovers, replacing carpet, paint, replacing a water heater at $1,700 by today's standards. Also, supply chains and limited in labor. So now, with some of the issues that have come up, you've heard about the delays that, you know, in terms of being able to, you know, the, that um, where the where the there's issues with the inspection. Adding a 30 to 60 day time frame to be able to get somebody get through the process to get somebody approved in their unit is not unusual. One month lost rent is 8.3 percent in lost revenue. Entire year's revenue, 8.3 percent of the entire year. And that is equating to almost a quarter of what they could potentially earn in a year. So now before they're even out of the gate, they've got, the, you know, that ends up be, being, um, being ha almost a quarter of the way to being a loss for the year. So I'd encourage being able to work with the agencies that are doing the inspections to be able to streamline the process so you can get long-term housing providers that really want to be able to work with people and can actually afford to be able to rent their houses to them. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Okay, thank thank you, you very much. Peter Julian. <coughs> Name and address for the record. Peter Julian, 1819 Sugar Maple Place, Bellbrook, Ohio, 45305. You may begin. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening, Good Mr. Evening. Mayor, City Commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to express uh, my opinion regarding the proposed ordinance uh, regarding source of income. Um, I am the owner of Pathfinder Realty. We currently manage about 900 rental properties. The majority of these properties are in the city of Dayton. Um, we feel that we are good corporate citizens. We take pride in our properties. And we feel that we're responsive to the needs of our residents. Uh, many of the houses in our rental portfolio were derelict houses that we purchased at the time we purchased them. We invested large sums of money, and oftentimes these houses are now the nicest houses in these neighborhoods. So, um, well, getting down to the subject at hand, almost all la landlords have income criteria, which they use as far as screening tenants. We currently have about 20 Section 8 houses in our rental portfolio uh, and that, that are subsidized by uh, GDPM. Several years ago, we made a decision, business decision, not to accept any new vouchers uh, from GDPM. We did not terminate the leases of the existing tenants. However, we've purposely not added new tenants under this program. Many of the issues with GDPM have been articulated recently to you uh, as a governmental body from different landlord groups and uh, associations. And just to reiterate, here are some of the factors influencing our decision to avoid adding new Section 8 tenants under uh, GDPM. Uh, inconsistent housing inspections, uh, delays in decision making and documentation from the housing authority, poor communication, telephone calls that rarely returned, email inquiries rarely returned. Finally, we said enough is enough and we stopped doing new Section 8. We continued with the ones that were on our, uh, that we continued, uh, that were on our portfolio. And I understand the Greater Dayton Premier Management has indicated that they're working on fixing issues and shortcomings, and I sincerely applaud that effort. I would ask that the Dayton City Commission at this time delay the proposed ordinance until uh, Greater Dayton Premier Management has demonstrated that the problem areas have indeed been rectified. If this proposed ordinance is passed at this time, I feel that this will result in 
uh, unintended consequences, such as rental properties being sold to homeowners, which will exacerbate the limited supply of rental houses even further. I know that we would refrain from purchasing existing derelict houses to rehabilitate and turn into rental properties in the city of Dayton until a satisfactory resu resolution is in place. I would ask that the city of Dayton, or the city commission rather, your body, refrain from passing the ordinance at this time. Once the housing authority has clearly fixed its internal problems, I would definitely be in support of the proposed, proposed ordinance, ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Julian. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Appreciate your time. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Tony Currington. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Tony Currington. Uh, I live at 250 Trail Woods Drive, Dayton, Ohio. I am a retiree, but I'm a highly concerned citizen of this community. And I am totally in support of this ordinance because it creates a pathway to the issues that we have in front of us each and every day when it comes to redlining. This is the solution. This is the pathway to redlining. I mean, you know, we sit and look at the maps all day long about the solutions to path line, path, uh, redlining, and it's hitting us right in our face when we're hit, we don't have ex when people don't have accessibility to generational wealth through home ownership or the pathway of renting to get started. But however, I'm here to just to share my my immediate story with a, a person I had that, that rented for me for 12 years, and I just recently sold it this past summer. And it was very heartfelt, the fact that I, 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 sell, I sold it and she didn't have anywhere else to go because she has Section 8. She couldn't use it anywhere else. There's a backlog of, people, of, of Section, 8 issue, uh, Section 8 accessibility. But the other thing is, is that, yes, we do have problems with GD, Greater Data Management, so Premier. But, you know, they're workable solutions. You know, we just can't just wave a wand and make it all go away. This, this happened and continues to happen over a period of time. But back to my, my intimate story, she took care of my property like she owned it. She became a member of the Homeowners Association. She didn't even own the property. She called, there was some damaged property in the community. She called and got it removed. Uh, so, I mean, this is what people learn as they embrace home ownership. Because we, gotta, we have to create the pathway for that to happen. We can't just turn a blind eye and say, well, it'll happen if somebody made wave a magic wand and it'll happen. It hasn't happened since the period of time. We've got to work at this step at a time, whatever it takes to work collaboratively with those people who are against it. But the thing about it is it needs to happen. People need to have the opportunity to have the pathway to home ownership or towards, <coughs> towards uh, rental op opportunities. Right now, without this ordinance, they, they remain just the way they are now. No opportunities unless they're in a red line area where people are desperate to rent to them. So I have to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garrington. Okay, thank you very much. Chrissy Pennington. Name and address for the record, please. Hello, I'm Chrissy Pennington. My address is 7755 Singer Road, Dayton, Ohio, 45424. You may begin. Thanks. Good evening. Hi. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. I am a what you would call a mom and pop rental property <coughs> owner, right? I have like eight doors. And um, there are a couple concerns that I've seen as I've been researching this type of legislation and how it has been working in different areas. Columbus is, being, is one of them. It's the one that really stands out to me because it's right next door, right? Um, I think we all can see, can say that there is a problem right now with Section okay. 8 housing. Try to address us. Address the commission. Okay. That there is a problem with Section 8 housing, okay. right? There's not enough of it. There are a lot of people that needs home, need homes and there are a lot of vouchers that are expiring. And that's something that needs to be tackled. What we've seen, though, is whenever you enact legislation like this, is that rents go up because HUD allows for that, and it affects the people without vouchers as well as the people with the vouchers. And so um, now you've created a, a supplemental problem because rent is going up for those who could afford it and now cannot. Um, you end up with more people on the voucher system for that reason and still not enough houses, right? We were talking about COVID a minute ago and how we ended up with such 
like a dwindling number of houses because the mom and pops like me can't afford to pay their mortgage if they're not receiving rent. So whenever we have um, a program that takes months before you get your rent, like the HUD voucher program, you're going to see a huge loss in mom and pops like me because I can't float that. So what's going to happen is you're going to have fewer rentals available to all people within the city of Dayton. And the only way that can be filled is probably by the larger corporations that can come in. And if you've ever rented from one of them, you know what they're like. They are not the ideal situation. You want somebody like me who face to face with my tenant all the time. I know them. I know their kids. I know their dog's names, right? I'm the kind of person that you want in the city of Dayton. I won't be able to do it if you pass legislation like this. There are places in the country like Wichita who instead of passing legislation like this has provided incentives. And so they provide incentives to housing providers like me to say, look, I know it might take a little bit for you to get your, your first payment. Let's work with that and make sure that you're not losing your mortgage and therefore losing your property. I think we need to look at those types of opportunities instead of just passing a piece of paper that has not been enforceable. Look at Columbus. They haven't even been able, like not once have they been able to enforce this. It sounds good, but it doesn't work. So you end up creating more problems instead of solutions. I think that the people that are concerned in this room if you asked, would come sit down at the table and try to work out some sort of good program that would work. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Taja Sally. Name and address for the record. Taja Sally, 660 Blossomwood Court, Troy, Ohio, 45373. You may begin. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having us this evening. This is in regards to source of income, um, in regards to the HUD program, not to the folks who actually receive the support. A voluntary housing program for tenants should not be a required program for all property owners. This removes the rights away from property owners and places it in the hands of a third party business. The bureaucracy surrounding this program are for small mom and pop rental businesses out, allowing larger companies to come in to only monopolize and profit <clears throat> from the ability to charge rents up to 120% higher of market value. This will only increase abuse of taxpayer funds. The additional required inspection process of the program will increase the cost burden of property owners, removing their ability to determine if a tenant or normal wear and tear caused damage. Delayed payments and higher eviction costs to property owners will also come into play <clears throat> and force these smaller businesses out of the rental business. In my past, I've personally rented from both individual and large companies in our area and trust me we don't want the larger companies to come in you definitely can feel the difference in care when you're dealing with a small owner versus a large company i don't think that this is the way to fix our program i think we need collaboration amongst property owners in the area um, not legislation to pass thank you thank you, thank you. sally emma smales Your name and address for the record. Emma Smales, 109 Floral Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, 45405. You may begin. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Mims and City Commissioners. Evening. Good evening. I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the Source of Income Non-Discrimination Ordinance. I'm a small business owner and a resident in the city of Dayton. I currently work for Learn to Earn Dayton and previously served as the Birth Outcomes Manager at Public Health Dayton and Montgomery County. As birth outcomes manager, I saw the stark disparities in the infant mortality rate between black and white babies. The black infant mortality rate is three times higher than the white infant mortality rate in this county. Knowing that housing quality impacts the health of the pregnant person and knowing that stable housing could improve birth outcomes, my coworker and I started a work group of housing experts to specifically address infant mortality through housing policy. That work group includes ABLE, the Public Defender's Office, Daybreak, Montgomery County, City of Dayton, Public Health, Dayton Children's, HRC, Gadaha, Miami Valley Fair Housing, Dayton Mediation, Citywide Development, Omega CDC, and more. 
this work group decided to pursue a source of income non-discrimination ordinance after looking at data, and I wanted to share some of that data with you today. A study out of Columbus showed that an experimental group of 50 pregnant women who were provided free, stable housing throughout pregnancy and one year postpartum had much better birth outcomes than a control group of 50 pregnant women who were not provided housing. In the housed group, zero babies died before their first baby, their first birthday. In the, unho- in the control group, four babies died. You heard last week that 488 families currently looking for housing are currently looking for housing with a housing choice voucher, and only 20% of those families will be successful in finding a landlord who will accept it. What they didn't mention last week was that the families only have six weeks to find a landlord to accept that voucher. The 390 families who will not be able to find a landlord to accept the voucher will lose it and go back onto a wait list with over 3,000 families on it. 86% of voucher recipients in Montgomery County are black. And the majority are single moms with kids. Housing choice vouchers are often used as a proxy to discriminate against women with children and renters of color. This ordinance will put a stop to that. The landlords and lawyers that spoke in opposition of this ordinance talk about supporting housing for all, but we know their number one priority is profit and not people. Anyone who says they support housing for all should support solutions that help more people get housing like this one. Thank you commissioners for putting the people of Dayton first by supporting this ordinance today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alyssa Blyerfeld. Name and address for the record, please. Alyssa Blyerveld, 300 Shadow Lawn Avenue, Dayton, Ohio, 45419. You may begin. Good evening, Mayor Mims and City Commissioners. I'm here tonight as a concerned citizen to speak in favor of the Source of Income Non-Discrimination Ordinance. I'm a longtime resident of the City of Dayton and a social worker, and I've worked with individuals from across our great city. I currently serve as a school social worker, but prior to this experience, I served as the Ohio Equity Institute Program Coordinator at Public Health Dayton and Montgomery County. And in this role, I work directly with pregnant and newly postpartum individuals, assisting them in meeting their basic needs and the needs of their growing families. Housing was one of the greatest needs among the women that we served. It was a great honor and privilege to serve these women and their children, and their stories have stayed with me. I'd like to share one of those stories with you tonight. I'll never forget the day that I received a frantic phone call from a grandmother in the hospital looking for a place for her son and his girlfriend to stay for the night. Her son's girlfriend had just given birth to her first grandchild early and very suddenly by cesarean section. The baby was in good health but would be staying in the NICU for a few days. The child's mother, however, was to be released that day and had nowhere to go. Her only option would be to go to the women's shelter alone after having just given birth by C-section. She would be expected to get herself to the bathroom, dining room, with no one to assist her in her aftercare, let alone assist her with her child once they were released from the NICU in a few days. As I continued talking with the grandmother, I learned that both her son and his girlfriend had been looking for a place of their own for months, but were unable to find something on their very tight budget as they were both disabled. They had spent the entirety of their pregnancy frantically applying for housing assistance and house hunting and had been unable to find any place they could afford that would accept their disability payments. As has been previously mentioned, not only does source of income discriminate disproportionately impact renters of color and women, it also disproportionately impacts people with disabilities. This was just one of a myriad of clients who faced housing barriers and was impacted by source of income discrimination. We assisted several clients who had recently received housing choice vouchers and could not find a landlord quickly enough and eventually lost that voucher. We had others still who were interested in applying for housing assistance, both housing choice vouchers and other subsidies, but they had already given up on the process because they had no hope that they would ever find a place to use any of the housing assistance that they might qualify for. We often had to advise individuals to move to another county just to increase the hopes of being able to use the housing assistance that they desperately needed and might qualify for. I urge you tonight to support this ordinance on behalf of these families and countless others who have been deeply impacted by this particular form of housing discrimination in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Meyerbill. Thank you. <clears throat> Paul Amagetcher. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Your name and address for the record. My name is Paul Amagatcher, um, 7804 Country View Lane, Brookville, Ohio, uh, 45403. 309, sorry. You may begin. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Commissioners. My name is Paul Amagatcher. I'm, an, I'm the owner of Okimbia Investment Properties. We are proud to provide affordable and high quality housing in the Northwest Dayton area. With 35 of our 53 properties located within the city limits, our tenant base is predominantly African American with 79% of our residents belonging to this community. Additionally, we, have, we currently have four units under the Section 8 program. I come before you to respectfully request that you vote against this proposed income discrimination ordinance. I believe the issue with the landlords not accepting Section 8 vouchers has more to do with the problem with the program and less to do with the discrimination against voucher holders. Over the past two years, we have made a difficult decision to withdraw from the Section 8 program due to a number of issues with Greater Dayton Premier Management. I would like to highlight four specific areas. First, GDPM is notoriously difficult to work with. Program is disorganized and it's almost impossible to get a response from anybody within the organization. Second, GDPM. Inspections are excessively stringent and focus on minor issues that self-paying tenants would not have any issues with. These nitpicking inspections are a major source of frustration for us landlords who are simply trying to provide quality housing for the tenants. Third, Section 8 payments are way below uh, the current market value. A uh, perfect example, recently had a tenant that we had a property listed for $1,000. Section 8 could only offer eight seventy five for the same property. This disparity makes it difficult for landlords to justify participating in the program. Finally, GDPM has denied several rent increases without explanation. It essentially goes into a void. I want to reiterate, reiterate that we as housing providers are not opposed to <clears throat> housing vouchers. The current GDPM program is broken. More and more housing providers will refuse to work with the program due to these problems and not due to discrimination. At the last meeting, it was stated that unfortunately these problems are out of our wheelhouse. It would have to be addressed at a state level. I do disagree with that statement. This is your wheelhouse. We, your citizens and housing providers, are experiencing a housing shortage in Montgomery County as well as Dayton. And if this is out of your wheelhouse, then do not pass the ordinance that will not resolve the real problem. Um, we would like to extend an arm to the HRC to be included in future discussions regarding housing discrimination and housing shortage. In conclusion, I urge you to consider the impact of this ordinance on the already strained housing market in Dayton and Montgomery County. There is a critical shortage of housing, affordable housing in our community, and this will only worsen the issue. Without innovative solutions such as adding more housing and reinstating the lot links program, which allowed us to clear title issues and bring back some of those vacant properties that are currently sitting on them uh, without anybody being allowed to um, renovate those properties, we won't be able to add more housing to the housing stock. Um, I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please, thank you. Mary Sue Geminer. Name and address, please. Mar Mary Sue Geminer, 1418 Arbor Avenue in Dayton. You may begin. Hey. But, Good evening, Mayor, Good evening. Commissioners, City Manager, Commission Clerk. Tonight I am speaking in support of 32024-23, the ordinance prohibiting source of income discrimination. Last November, when I stood before you commending you for the informal resolution supporting housing rights, I said that I was looking forward to legislation that would have some teeth. You have that here tonight, thank you. At a time when shelters, our shelters are full to overflowing and we have hundreds of families with Section 8 vouchers looking to put a roof over their heads, we cannot deny them that possibility just because the rent is coming from Section 8. At last week's meeting, many property owners stepped forward with their concerns about this legislation, and this week too. One property owner commented that every day a home stands vacant is a day that you will never be able to earn income on that unit unlike selling a manufactured product where if you don't sell it today, you can sell it another time and just recap your costs. With housing, you never get to go back and get that income. The flip side of that is that every day, a mother with her Section 8 voucher looks for housing for herself and her children and doesn't find it is a day that pushes that family further into trauma and despair. I noticed that many of these property owners didn't have City of Dayton addresses. Perhaps they don't understand the importance of Dayton city government 
doing everything within their power to fight poverty in our city. That's what this legislation does. This ordinance is a necessary step to end housing discrimination. So I encourage you to, to put this legislation in place now, continue to work with Greater Dayton Premier Management, um, but I support passage of Ordinance 32024-23. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gamonner. Okay, thank you. Jennifer Gonzalez. Jennifer Gonzalez, 15 Greencliff Drive, Union, Ohio, 45322. You may begin. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Again, my name is Jennifer Gonzalez, and I work with public health, specifically with their infant mortality work. 50% of an individual's well-being is affected by where we live, work, play, and pray. And these social determinants of health include social, economic, and environmental factors, such as housing. We not only have a housing problem, but an infant mortality problem. The state of Ohio has some of the highest infant mortality rates across the nation, and data has continuously highlighted racial disparities in infant mortality rates. In fact, 2020 data from the Ohio Department of Health showed that black infants in Ohio were about three times more likely to die than white infants before reaching the age of one. We see similar trends in Montgomery County, and due to these health disparities, there are numerous local efforts focused on helping babies reach the age of one. My team of navigators works closely with pregnant and postpartum mothers. As they work to identify how they can support our moms, they see how housing insecurity affects our clients. The latest data on our housing assessment showed that 44% of moms who completed our assessment were experiencing housing insecurity, facing challenges with stable housing that they own, rent, or stay in. From our data, we also know that 19% of moms we serve are currently living with family or friends. Living with someone else brings its own set of challenges as it relates to how you manage your home or what you're exposed to. When asked about issues contributing to housing difficulties, 56% of respondents shared that this was due to inadequate stable income. Others mentioned the inability to use Section 8 housing vouchers and discrimination based on source of income. Housing insecurity increases maternal stress, and if moms are experiencing difficulties with housing, we know that they're probably facing other challenges as well, such as food insecurity, economic stability, and so on. These stressors can all lead to adverse pregnancy outcomes, increasing the risk of infant mortality. As mentioned earlier, a recent study in Columbus called Healthy Beginnings at Home showed how stable housing increases the likelihood of healthy babies being born, with more babies born on time, babies spending less time in the hospital after birth, and less infant deaths. Addressing housing insecurity is crucial for promoting healthier outcomes. Policies like source of income protection increase access to the rental market by ensuring that source of income, like Section 8 vouchers, Social Security, and disability, are considered and accepted. By increasing housing op options for our community, we'll also reduce the stressors that are affecting the health of our families and our babies. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you very much. Sean Mitchell. Your name and address for the record. Yeah, I'm Sean Mitchell, 205 Jackson, Dayton, Ohio, 45402. You may begin. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to lie to all of you. I'm kind of here on a whim. Uh, I didn't really know what I was going to say and was kind of caught up here. Because I originally thought maybe I'd start with statistics. We know we're in a housing crisis. Uh, on the west side right now, there's about a 1% occupancy rate. 5% uh, is what they deem healthy for communities. For every affordable unit right now, there are three families trying to reach that. But that's not what I'm going to get into. I love this city, I do. Uh, I recently traveled with a friend to Seattle and convinced uh, three or four people to vacation to Dayton, Ohio. I don't know if you know this, we don't have palm trees. Um, but through that, I love this city because I've been so dedicated. Uh, we have so many rock stars that show up. We have so many kick-ass services that are really putting forth effort and we're making a difference. I'm here in support tonight, though, and I'm speaking to you really from my heart. Um, I've given a lot of time, and I wake up every day, and I try to fight for those that need a voice. And frankly, I'm, I'm tired. 
I'm worn down and I'm tired of going home tired because it doesn't need to be easy. Well, I'm just asking you, can we make it a little bit easier? This ordinance does that. I know I could throw out statistics, but I want to come from my heart and I just want to say, please, please, as neighbors, can we just make it a little bit easier? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you very much. Greg Blatt. Good evening, Greg Blatt, President of Dayton Realtors, 2532 Indian Wells Trail, Xenia, Ohio. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager, Clerk, thank you. I hey, uh, was here last week. We spoke. Um, again, I just want to go on the record and say that Dayton Realtors uh, fully understands the issue at hand. We work in the real estate community. We, we make our living here, and we have a very strong interest in seeing that the city of Dayton not only survives, but thrives. We are 100% against discrimination in any way, shape, or form, positive or reverse discrimination. You've heard a lot of testimony this evening about the impacts of this, and I'm sure you're all very smart people. You've probably all taken Economics 101. Economics 101 talks about supply and demand. The biggest issue we have is not a discrimination issue, it's the fact that these people can't get housing because it doesn't exist. It's not out there in enough volume for people to get there. That's why these vouchers are expiring. No legislation by threat of criminal activity, if you don't comply, is going to drive money to this city. One lady mentioned that a lot of people that spoke tonight have addresses outside the city. You know why? Because they invest in the city. They bring their hard-earned capital here to make investments in the city. We've heard about redlining. Dayton Realtors is against redlining. But if this legislation passes, you're going to put a red line around the city of Dayton, and you're going to send a message to every investor outside of the city that the city of Dayton is closed for business, that if you come here it's a high-risk environment, and that we will threaten you with lawsuits if you don't comply with our demands. That's not the way you fix this problem. We fix this problem by sitting down and having meaningful conversations about how not to disincentivize people to invest in the city of Dayton, but how to incentivize them to bring their capital here. We want people to invest in the city of Dayton. We want them to build affordable housing. We need common sense legislation to do that, not threats of, of criminal uh, complaints and lawsuits. That will only drive investment dollars away. And I know that's not what each one of you want, is it? That's not what you want. So. Let's sit down, let's have a meaningful conversation about how we can attract and incentivize people to bring their investment dollars to the city of Dayton. We want to see the city of Dayton thrive. We have a vested interest. These outside investors, they don't. They want to take the money out of the city of Dayton and take it to other communities outside of this area. We want those dollars to say, stay here. We want to work with you all. So I'm going to ask you, please postpone this legislation until we can have a meaningful conversation to come up with real common sense solutions to address this problem. We want to see it fixed just as much as everybody else. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Black. Tammy Galdine. Your name and address for the record. Tammy Galdine, uh, 1741 Spring Meadows Drive, Xenia, Ohio. You may begin. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Commissioners. I, too, am one of those mom and pop um, folks here that does not have a Dayton address but is an investor in Dayton. I currently own two properties that I rent out and would love to continue to rent out and buy more properties um, here in Dayton as well. But legislation like this um, would make it very, very difficult for me to want to continue to do that. Um, I echo very much what Greg Blatt said and uh, the concerns that we have, and I ask very much that you take that into consideration before you um, make your decision on this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gardine. <laughs> Miranda Wilson. Hi. 
name and address for the record. Please. Miranda Wilson on behalf of the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center, 505 Riverside Drive, Dayton, Ohio, 45405. You may begin. Um, thank you for <laughs> proposing, for, for letting everyone speak about this matter, but also proposing this legislation. And one thing I want to just say for the good of everyone in the room is that this proposed legislation, the consequences are civil, not criminal. Um, it's uh, just because that's an important difference. Um, and this legislation wouldn't require anyone, wouldn't force anyone to accept a voucher. It would ensure that people not have the door slammed in their face because of their source of income, whether that's social security disability or a voucher or child support. Um, and because at the Fair Housing Center, we, you know, there's been talk of redlining. Um, and what we have seen is locally um, that source of income and vouchers are used as a proxy. So I can't say no to you because of your race, but I can say no to you because your source of income or your source of your ability to pay, pay your rent is a voucher. I can say no to you because you're a single parent with children because you have a voucher. I can say no to you because you have a disability and your source of income is social security. I can close the door on you that way. We don't need to have any further conversation. Um, and that affects us all as a community, but it affects those 400 families that are currently looking for some place to accept their voucher. And if they run out of time on those vouchers, their housing instability doesn't end, it continues. And that affects us all. Um, it affects the, those households specifically, but what do they do then? They then continue to stay somewhere that they may be paying more than 50% of their income for rent because they can't find somewhere that will accept their voucher and pass an inspection, which is, means you're not even one bad day from losing your housing, you're five minutes, one five, five minute period. <laughs> you know, you get a flat tire, your kid, uh, is late for the bus and you have to take them to school and you're late to work um, and you get docked pay. This will protect people from, it will give people more options to live their lives the way that they want to live them and need to live them. Um, without this, you know, people are doubled up. They uh, have housing that doesn't meet their needs. They stay in housing that is in poor condition because they know that they're not going to be able to, to get approved to live anywhere else because of their source of income. And so I, I urge you to support this, um, and thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Thank Wilson. you very much. <clears throat> that is all, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Okay, hey, commissioners, uh, comments on the uh, city manager recommendations? Mr. Sean Schloss? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, I want to echo Ms. Dixteen's comments in regards to some of the date and recovery plan items that we see before us on the calendar, item number five. Thank you for bringing that before us as well as uh, highlighting the uh, participation goals. Appreciate the HRC's work on that. And then also, I really appreciate you highlighting items number 11, 12, and 13 in regards of, to the ESIS and PACE. Uh, legislation that we have before us and understanding that this is in fact the first step and that there will be uh, more details that will come before us. And I have to have to underscore the mention of the community benefits agreement. So again, thank you very much for the work on that and the, um, and the staff work on that as well. I also would like to say in very brief because I know we're, we're coming close on the evening in terms of time, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I, I want to thank everyone um, that made the, um, the time to attend this evening's commission meeting. Um, and I, we've heard a lot of uh, comments in regards to um, it, it, the legislation that we see before us in terms of the second reading for um, For item number eight um, and amending sections 32.02 and 32.05 and 32.16 in regards to sources of income, um, the ban against sources of income. Um, but I, again, I wanted to thank everyone for their address and redress before this body. 
Um, and this has been a core issue of mine and why, in fact, I decided to run for office. So this is very dear to me. Um, as a, uh, a child, uh, my family, we actually suffer from housing insecurity. So I know the importance and the severity of what we're dealing with in terms of the housing crisis that we see across the country and specific to the Dayton area. So again, I, I do believe that the comments that have been made this evening are warranted in regards of us coming together and working together to identify what gaps that potentially are in place in regards to the process and streamlining, streamlining that process with GDPM and the, um, the homeowners and uh, landlords that we have in the Dayton area. So again, it's my hope that we will come together under the direction and leadership of the mayor, uh, Mayor Mims. He has um, sent a correspondence to outline what, in fact, this ordinance does and does not do. And so again, I would just implore everyone that is here to really take an opportunity to read the ordinance, to read it and understand and dissect the language and what we have before us. <coughs> and also, it is my hope that, um, again, that we understand that this is not just in regards to uh, HCV, the housing choice voucher, but it is an opportunity for us, the city of Dayton, for us to improve our housing quality standards across the city. We have an opportunity to do so with all of the work that has been done thus far, as Ms. Gminer mentioned the informal housing resolution in regards to uh, the Housing Bill of Rights. There's also been ongoing conversation with uh, the eviction task force in which this legislation was drafted out of that eviction task force, as well as the housing roundtable. So it is my hope that we will see more programs and incentives to one of the comments that was made by uh, one of the members here this evening, one of the attendees, that we will see incentives that will be in place. It is my hope that we will see that come before us so that we can assist uh, homeowners and property owners into making sure that they meet the necessarily quality of standards that we have across the city, not only um, for those who may participate in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So again, I'll keep my comments short. Uh, I am very happy to see this legislation. I am very proud and I want to commend my colleagues for bringing this forward and for us to agree on this. We understand what we're dealing with and we've heard the statistics, we've heard a number of comments and testimonies, personal testimonies. And again, I just want to applaud um, my colleagues and the staff, uh, HRC, Marty Garrison, his office for bringing this before us as well as the entire uh, eviction task force, Deborah Levy, Abel, uh, GDPM, uh, uh, the Greater Dayton Apartment Association that was also involved, uh, Miami Valley Fair Housing. This is an opportunity for us to work together. This is the first step, and so I hope that you all are not willing, those who are in opposition of this legislation, I hope you are not willing to close the door, but find a way for us to work common ground so that we can address these issues. The last thing I will say is that I am too uh, had an opportunity to actually participate in the voucher program as a landlord. So I do understand the concerns that you have, but I also am simply um, sympathetic to the fact that we have to have those quality housing standards in place. It is a necessity because there are too many residents in the city of Dayton across this county who are living in poor conditions. We have to do better. It is not only on uh, the, the, the private landlords or the mom and pop landlords, but it is also incumbent upon our local government to do better. So you have my level of commitment and I'm willing to sit at the table and have that conversation, as well as my colleagues, which I'm sure you all, all have seen the correspondence that was sent on behalf of the mayor and my colleagues. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Commissioner Fairchild. Yeah. Uh, let me th start with thank you. So thank you to Marty Garris and uh, Ms. Dixteen, our law department staff who've worked on this, colleagues for working together to get us to this point. And thank you to all the citizens who have come out to um, to push us to, to be the best that we can be. Um, when I do this work, I'm there's a quote by uh, Hubert Humphrey that always um, helps to guide me. He said, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are, who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Uh, knowing the importance of housing for the social determinants of health, 
makes me realize that this um, legislation is necessary because we know that discrimination exists. And if we didn't know that dis if discrimination didn't exist, there would be no need for this type of legislation. Um, so I'm supporting it. Um, I think that both things can be true. I think that we could have a supply problem and discrimination can exist. I would even believe that uh, the shorter supply probably exasperates the discrimination problem. And so I look forward to working on both these issues of how do we address the supply issue as well as the discrimination issue. Um, I'm, uh, thanks for those who have raised up the uh, example in Wichita. I'll be glad to look at that. And um, I believe there is work that we can do alongside of this um, adoption of this, um, this resolution that can work together in concert that we can look for incentives because I think we all have a commitment to improving the quality of life in, in our community. And so I look forward to looking for those who really do want to move there where we have no discrimination in housing in our community and uh, work on that common ground. And then uh, lastly, I want to thank um, those of you who are working on the front lines of uh, with, our, with those who are in the shadows and in the twilight and in the dawn of their life are most vulnerable. It's difficult work, it's complex work. Um, the work around infant mortality should convict us all. Uh, the fact that our rate of infant mortality is so high um, in a, a developed society in a state like ours in a city like ours and then add in the racial disparity is damning on us. And so thank you for the work that you do. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. <coughs> And thank uh, all of those who have come to share information with us on both sides of this question. I know that um, you, you uh, are committed to the work and, uh, and I just appreciate you for sharing all this. Uh, it's very, it is a very complex question and uh, I know that we can find a solution in the middle. I, it sounds like there is an opportunity to streamline some inspection processes at, uh, at GDPM. And I hope that we commit ourselves to doing that work so that we can make things just a little bit easier for both landlords and, and tenants uh, looking for, for housing. So I want to thank my colleagues for this work. And uh, it's really important that we put this on the table. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Joseph. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to echo my colleagues' thanks to everyone here for coming out uh, to the Eviction Task Force, Marty, uh, our law department, and my colleagues for working through this. Uh, it was mentioned a couple times that this is not a complete solution, right? This is something that's going to push us in the right direction. Uh, but as a big picture guide, I think we should take a step back and look at what will be the big picture solution. And that is going to be making sure working people have more money in their pockets, that uh, too much is going to too few right now. We have to figure out how to do that better uh, because that, uh, that, that takes care of a bigger chunk of this problem. Not all of it, but a bigger chunk. But I'm proud to be part of the solution here, and I want to thank everyone for the advocacy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I want to thank my colleagues again. Uh, they shared a lot of what uh, I was going to say as well. And also thank all of you for being here. I do want to add to a couple of issues that we're continuously working on as well to help address this problem. Uh, maybe uh, not in the exact short term, although we're going to continue to work on, on this issue, but long term. Uh, from an educational perspective, to get more and more of our citizens and, and young people into the job market in a position where they can help contribute to some of the challenges that we have with uh, regards to our income. Uh, we've been doing a good job over the last nine years because we've seen our medium income increase you know, significantly. Uh, the other thing that uh, we're continuously working on is, uh, again, like I said, with the workforce. Uh, the workforce is a critical component. Uh, as we talk about issues with more and more people uh, in the past who have been in a situation where their income has not been as supportive as they would like to have to be able to make the kind of contribution to themselves and to this community, and then uh, uh, clearly connected with not being able to uh, contribute to others as far as quality of life opportunities are concerned. The issue with uh, our infant mortality is, is something that's inexcusable. Uh, we all have to do a better job in terms of working with that. And um, I know I see many of you out there that we've worked with in the past, even those who are, are not necessarily here from the uh, city of Dayton, but you hear a lot, and I, I do appreciate the work that you've done. So we'll continue to work together. I appreciate that. And you take a look at the letter that we, uh, we did send, and um, 
Uh, we'll sit down some more, and we continue to try to work through this to see how we can make it better. Again, thank you so much. Okay. So, at this point in time, I'd like to set the motion um, to approve the city manager's recommendations. Your Honor, I move we approve the city manager's recommendations. Second, Your Honor. Okay, it's been probably moved and seconded to approve the city manager's recommendations. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Okay. Uh, we have uh, legislation then, please, uh, Ms. Blackshear. First reading emergency resolution number 6710-23. Authorizing the submission of a grant application and authorizing the acceptance of a grant award from the Montgomery County Solid Waste District in, a, in the amount of $70,000.00 on behalf of the City of Dayton and declaring an emergency. I move that we declare resolution number 6710-23 an emergency. Second, Your Honor. Okay, it's been probably moved and seconded to declare uh, resolution number 671023 as an emergency. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay, thank you. Second reading emergency ordinance number 32023 23, determining that a petition to establish the Delco New Community Authority is sufficient and complies with requirement of Ohio Revised Code section 349.03 in form and substance, setting the time and place for a public hearing on the petition, authorizing notice by publication of such public hearing. Mayor Mims? Aye. Commissioner Joseph? Aye. Shaw? Aye. Bear Chow? Aye. Turner Sloss? Aye. Second reading emergency ordinance number 32024-23, amending sections 32.02, 32.05 and 32.16 of the Revised Code of General Ordinances to include source of income as a prohibited form of housing discrimination within the City of Dayton. Mayor Mims? Aye. Commissioner Joseph? Aye. Shaw? Aye. Fairchild? Aye. Turner Sloss? Aye. Second reading emergency resolution number 6708-23 authorizing the submission of a grant application and authorizing the acceptance of a grant award from the Montgomery County Solid Waste District in the amount of $59,388.92 on behalf of the City of Dayton. Mayor Mims? Aye. Commissioner Joseph? Aye. Shaw? Aye. Fairchild? Aye. Turner Sloss? Aye. Second reading emergency resolution number 6709-23, approving the submission of a grant application and authorizing the acceptance of a grant award from the Montgomery County Solid Waste District in the amount of $13,023.53 on behalf of the City of Dayton. Mayor Mims? Aye. Commissioner Joseph? Aye. Shaw? Aye. Fairchild? Aye. Turner Sloss? Aye. First reading ordinance number 32025-23, approving the petition and supplemental plan for special energy improvement projects under Ohio Revised Code Chapter 1710, approving the necessity of acquiring, constructing, and improving certain public improvements in the city of Dayton, Ohio, in cooperation with the Dayton Regional Energy Special Improvement District. First reading ordinance number 32026-23, determining to proceed with the acquisition, construction, and improvement of certain public improvements in the city of Dayton, Ohio, in cooperation with the Dayton Regional Energy Special Improvement District. First reading ordinance number 32027-23, levying special assessments for the purpose of acquiring, construct, constructing, and improving, improving certain public improvements in the city of Dayton in cooperation with the Dayton Regional Energy Special Improvement District, authorizing and approving a cooperative agreement and special assessment agreement agreement for the public improvement, for those public improvements. 
informal resolution number 1002-23, establishing the city, co city commission's opposition to the new voter identification and non-citizen notation law passed by the Ohio General Sen Assembly and signed into law by Governor DeWine. Okay. <clears throat> I need a vote on the informal. Okay, all right. Your Honor, I move the immediate passage of informal resolution number 1002-23. That's yours. Second the motion, Your Honor. Okay, it's been probably moved and seconded to uh, support informal resolution number 1002-23. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Okay. And that is all I have, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Blackshear, do you have any registered uh, citizens um, to speak? There are none, Your Honor. There are none? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Dixon, any closing comments? I have none, Your Honor. Okay. Roll along. Blackshear, any closing comments? I have none, Your Honor. You have none. Okay. That was Terrence Loss. Keep the ball rolling. I know you got some. <laughs> 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 I do too, so I'm not, I'm not picking on you. So. Okay, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Shamrady. I appreciate you being here this evening, Mr. Marty Garris, Ms. Debbie Levy, Ms. Joe Bocaro, Mr. Jeff Bowling, Mr. Peter Julian, Mr. Tony Carrington, Ms. Chrissy Pennington, Ms. Uh, Tasia Sally, Ms. Emma Mills, Ms. Alyssa Byerbelt. Mr. Paul Amagartri, and I would like to, sir, if we can have a conversation afterwards, because I want to make sure that, that you understand that I stand by what I said in regards to uh, this current issue, in regards to the streamlining the process with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. That is, in fact, an issue at the federal level. However, there's conversation, and I'm hoping that we can continue that conversation on how we streamline the process. And I also will implore everyone to be sensitive to the fact that we are dealing with a labor labor shortage across all sectors. So it is not just with GDPM, the city of Dayton is experiencing, right, Patterson Air Force Base is experiencing, all sectors of the workforce are experiencing labor shortages. So again, we have to make sure that we are mindful of that and understand that the process is not being a bottleneck because of someone's unwillingness to do their job. But the fact that we're dealing with these issues and they have been exasperated by COVID-19. So again, I just want to make sure that we make mention of that. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mary Sue Gamina for your comments, Ms. Jennifer Gonzalez, Mr. Sean Mitchell, Mr. Greg Blot, Ms. Tammy Gardeen, and Ms. Miranda Wilson. Thank you all for being here this evening. And again, I appreciate everyone's time and their commitment before us. So thank you. Okay, welcome. Commissioner Vestal. Yeah, um, I think we said a lot tonight. Um, I invite people to come out the first Friday. Art Hop is this Friday. So I always encourage folks to come out. Um, but I really want to encourage you to make your plans. Um, I don't know if you're a college basketball fan or not, but this is quite the college basketball season, even though most of our teams are going to need a lot of help come uh, <laughs> conference tournament time. So we can still have hope. But uh, Dayton starts it all, so I encourage people to look at, uh, for the events on March 12th as well as uh, to participate in the uh, first four games on the 14th and the 15th. Put those on your calendar. And, uh, and um, you know, Brandon McLean was here. I, did, I got to thank him in person for the work he did on black history. Uh, I'm curious who's going to fill that void as today starts off Women's History Month. And uh, I don't know, but why has uh, some posts, daily posts on to help me learn my women's history. But uh, I encourage everyone to take the opportunity in this month to learn a little bit about the contribution of women in uh, our society. Okay, Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I did want to inform my colleagues that I participated on the uh, Tax Incentive Review Council. Uh, very successful. Um, no delinquencies, things are moving along right away, and it just goes to show that this very important and valuable economic development tool is being utilized and utilized effectively. So thank you, city manager and, and many, many others, uh, bringing a lot of uh, development opportunities to the airport, to the city, uh, to, the, to the region and, and, and uh, all around. And then I want to congratulate uh, the president, the Dayton unit NAACP, <laughs> for uh, his receiving the uh, Image Award this past weekend um, for his advocacy. And it, it is just uh, remarkable the kind of work that that organization has been doing in this community and he has been doing in particular. So I really want to thank him. And uh, it turns out he popped the question 
asked a young lady to marry him on the stage, and that is just so oh, wow. like him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, congratulations to him, and congratulations to the org uh, to the organization in, uh, in general for their great work. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Shaw. I'm sitting on the edge of my sh seat. What? What was her answer? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 That might have made right. national news, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. not okay. in the best way. Mr. Joseph. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two things. Uh, first, there was a suggestion uh, one of the speakers made that we need to make sure to uh, follow up with GDPM uh, measurement-wise, and I think that's a good suggestion. We love our metrics here, uh, so we can follow up and make sure that uh, things are happening and moving in the right direction. That was a reasonable request. Second is I uh, want to let folks know that uh, Keep thinking, uh, keep donating, uh, keep working to relieve the pain that's going on in Turkey and Syria. There are continuing aftershocks, big ones just a couple of days ago, 5.6 on the Richter scale, and uh, there's a lot of need there. So if you have a chance to donate, there are numerous places to donate online. Uh, our local uh, mosques and local Ahiska Turkish organizations can also direct you where to help. So I just want to urge people to keep, keep giving and keep helping. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to thank. Um, Again, the Water Department for their winning the um, United Way Challenge <laughs> and uh, also winning my uh, pancake breakfast. Uh, was about 200 guys and ladies uh, in that location this past Thursday. And I'd like to also thank the members of the staff uh, because they were tremendous in terms of helping me uh, um, you know, prepare and, uh, and, and distribute those pancakes. So, again, everybody enjoyed it immensely. And that, that was left over. The staff brought it back. I think they had some here at the office. So um, uh, we'll do that again sometime soon. So, uh, But anyway, thank all who were involved in that process. I also want to um, uh, thank and congratulate 16 police officers who took their oath uh, this past Friday. And thank my colleagues for being there as well. Uh, it was a great ceremony. Got to hear some, some great comments uh, from, from um uh, the keynote speaker about just how important it is to be a police person and uh, very, very heartwarming. And again, glad I was had uh, there was support from my colleagues. Additionally, uh, Read Across America started today. And for those who have relationships uh, with schools, going in and reading to some of the young people is something that is very much appreciated. And if you don't have one, just call the school system. I'm sure they'll find a space for you to, to go and, um, and so to say some words of encouragement to our young people. They, they are very excited about hearing um, and seeing people from outside the, the system come in and give them some words of encouragement. And as we talk about education, I do want to mention uh, I had the honor of being with uh, the President, uh, Dr. Pinkert, from Wilberforce University uh, last Friday morning as they were visited by the uh, Small Business Administration and they signed an MOU, and that MOU was to increase um, entrepreneurship at uh, Wilberforce University and to look for developing more pipelines from uh, area schools, in particular, I know Dayton Public Schools, to move more and more young people into that space. So as we talked about the aspect of how we can increase more and more employment, more and more businesses, and more and more business owners into uh, this region. It is certainly um, something that will help us down the line address some of the kind of concerns that we're all raising here today. And so um, one other thing, we mentioned basketball. So we talked about college, we didn't talk about high school. Mm -hmm. So we have two local teams, uh, both Dunbar High School and uh, uh, Shamala Julianne are still <coughs> hanging in there in terms of boys tournaments. They both will play this Sunday at Xavier. Now, they were not playing each other, so again, there's, there's time for at least one of them or both of them to still make it to the next round. So it's Sunday afternoon at Xavier. I don't have the exact time, but I think it's 2 o'clock. <laughs> and sure, you can um, get time to get tickets and um, be there in the place and, and show your support for those teams. And with no further business to come before this commission, this uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much.